guys it's me professor d and welcome back to my channel on this video i'm going to be covering fundamentals but to be more specific i'll be covering care of the surgical patient you know what comes next guys i'm gonna ask you to go ahead like and subscribe below if you haven't done so already press that red button so you'll be notified every time a new video is released so without any further ado guys let's get started a 43 year old client is scheduled to have a gastrectomy which of the following is a major preoperative concern? One, the client's brother had a tonsillectomy at age 11. Two, the client smokes a pack of cigarettes a day. Three, the client has an IV infusion. Or four, the client has a history of employment as a computer programmer. If you're new to my channel, Go ahead and just press that pause button, give yourself time to look at the question, think about your answers, and as soon as you're ready, press play and we'll continue. So the correct answer, guys, is to the client that smokes a pack of cigarettes a day. Now, remember what I taught you guys on my previous videos. For those of you who've been following me, I've been very clear. When a patient has surgery, our biggest top concerns are the patient bleeding, hemorrhaging to death, infection, patient getting pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, DVT, right? So our biggest concern is that patient that smokes a pack of cigarettes a day, right? Smoking puts you at risk for what? DVT. That DVT can move, go to the patient's lung. Now the patient's got a pulmonary embolism, which is a medical emergency, right? Also, that patient that smokes, is go um, they have a higher risk of having pulmonary complications such as what? Pneumonia, atelectasis. Things that we are worried about happening just from having surgery. Patient has surgery. They're not moving around like they're supposed to. They're already at risk for these pulmonary conditions. And then you got smoking on top of it. So smoking is going to be our biggest concern for um, pulmonary complications. An appendectomy is appropriately documented by the nurse as one, diagnostic surgery, two, palliative surgery, three, ablative surgery, or four, reconstructive surgery. And the correct answer, guys, is three, ablative surgery. So go back to the question. In the question, it says appendectomy. Whenever something ends in ectomy, that means removal of. And the blade of surgery is either an excision or removal of a diseased body part. So that is the correct answer. Now let's look at our other choices. You have one, diagnostic surgery. That's actually the surgery when they go in to take a look around. They suspect the patient maybe has cancer or something, but they're looking to see, and they might even take a, make a, take a biopsy to test it later, right? So diagnostic is really where they're searching for something and they're testing for something. Two, palliative surgery. This type of surgery is only for comfort measures. It's not to bring uh, healing, it's not to bring restoration, it's just to make the patient more comfortable. So for example, if the patient has a tumor, but it is um, a terminal diagnosis, that patient's gonna die, right? They may get surgery to remove part of the tumor, not to heal them, not to restore their health, but just to help them breathe better. Maybe the tumor's in the lung. So when it comes to palliative, that's just to bring comfort to the patient, not healing. And then choice four, reconstructive surgery. That's to actually restore the function or the appearance of a body part. Okay, but ablative is actually the removal or the excision of a body part. Next question. An obese client is admitted for abdominal surgery. The nurse recognizes that this client is more susceptible to the postoperative complication of one, anemia, two, seizures, three, protein loss, or four, dehiscence. And the correct answer is for dehiscence. Why? Because when that patient's obese, they've got a lot of what? Abdominal girth. What kind of surgery is this patient getting? Abdominal surgery. So we're expecting the wound to be in the abdomen. All of that abdominal girth, if you watch my other video that I did on 
esophageal problems. I talked about this when the patient is obese, they have a lot of abdominal girth. girth what does that cause? A lot of what? Abdominal pressure. And that can cause the wound to open up. That can cause dehiscence. So that's what we're going to be concerned about the most. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. We have one, anemia. We'd be more concerned about anemia in a patient that was malnourished, right? Choice two, seizures. We'd be more concerned with seizures in a patient that has hypocalcemia. If you watch my fluid and electrolyte video, I talked about this extensively. Hypocalcemia causes what? Nus uh, muscle and nerve irritation, excitability. That could put the patient at risk for seizures. We'd expect this in patients that has other neurological conditions. Three, protein loss. We'd expect to see this in a patient that would have a disease process such as liver disease, or maybe if a patient had severe burn, if you watch my video on burns, I talked about the fluid shift from the protein loss, right? So we would expect that. But when it comes to um, um, dehiscence, uh, one of the concerns would be that obese patient. So that is why four is the answer. The nurse is working in a post-op care unit in an ambulatory surgery center. Of the following clients that have come to surgery, the client at greatest risk during surgery is one, a 78-year-old taking analgesic agent, two, a 43-year-old taking an antihypertensive agent, three, a 27-year-old taking an anticoagulation agent, anticoagulant agent, or four, a 10 year old, a 10 year old taking an antibiotic. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is three, the patient taking an anticoagulant. Why? They might bleed to death. What do anticoagulants do? They keep the patient from clotting. Well, guess what? Clotting is good because clotting is what keeps you from bleeding out. So if the patients take, um, taking an anticoagulant. What do you think is going to happen when the doctor puts that, does that incision, cuts into the patient? The patient can bleed out. So that is going to be our biggest concern. By the way, guys, if you see me keep closing my eyes like this, my eyes are severely dry. I couldn't find any eye drops in the house. So I figured let me make this video first before I run the target and get some eye drops. So if you see me constantly going like this, I'm really just trying to lubricate my eyes because it's very irritating. All right, so um, next question. A 92-year-old client is scheduled for a colectomy. Which normal physiological change that accompanies the aging process increases the client's risk for surgery? One, increased tactile sensation. Two, increased metabolic rate. Three, a relaxation of the arterial walls. Or four, reduced glomerular filtration rate. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is four, reduce glomerular filtration rate. Now, as I've talked to you about this before, the patients who are part of the geriatric population, the elder, elderly patients, is just wear and tear of the body. We tend to see what? Decrease in liver function and decrease in kidney function. And these are the two biggest organs that... Um, work towards medications. The liver does what? Metabolizes the medications, breaks it down, and the kidneys does what? Gets rid of that medication through urination. So if the liver is not working the way it used to, and the kidneys not working the way it used to, that means the medications stay in the body for much longer than normal right? And the patient's more at risk for toxicity. So we are going to be concerned about this. So that is why number four is the correct answer. The nurse is completing the pre-op checklist for an adult female client who is scheduled to have operative procedure late in the morning. Which of the following pre-op assessment findings for this client indicates a need to contact the surgeon? One, hemoglobin of 14. Two, BUN of 15, three, platelet of 300,000, or four, serum creatinine of 3.2. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is serum creatinine of 3.2. That's what we're going to be concerned about, guys. The normal creatinine is what? 0 0.5 to 1. This patient's at 3.2. We're worried about them going into what? Kidney failure. Okay, let's look at our other choices. You have one hemoglobin of 14. Nothing's wrong with that. Normal is 12 to 16. That's fine. 
Two, BUN of 15. Nothing wrong with that. The normal BUN is 10 to 20. Three, platelet of 300,000. Nothing wrong with that. The normal is 150,000 to 400,000. So all of those fall within normal range, except for that creatinine, okay? And so that's what we're gonna be concerned about and we're gonna notify the physician. The nurse is evaluating the outcome. Client describes surgical procedures and post-op treatment and determines that the client has not achieved this outcome. The nurse should, one, obtain consent because this is expected with pre-op anxiety. Two, teach a client all about the procedure. Three, ask the unit manager to assist with the teaching plan. Or four, inform the surgeon that the information can be provided. And the correct answer is four, inform the surgeon that information can be provided. This is a famous test question, guys. You see it on HESI, you see it on ATI, you see it on NCLEX. I don't care how busy that surgeon is. I don't care in the question if they tell you that surgeon is about to go save somebody's life. If that patient says that they do not understand the adverse effects that may happen during the procedure, the details of what may happen, no, the adverse effect that may happen after the procedure, the details of what may happen during the procedures, um, what may happen to them if they don't have the procedure. You cannot explain that to the patient. Your job as the RN is to witness the consent, make sure it's informed consent, right? Make sure the patient wasn't medicated before they signed and put that consent in the patient's chart not to explain this information. So you absolutely must call the surgeon back and they have to um, provide this information. Otherwise, it's not informed consent. It's not informed consent if the patient is not properly informed. Which of the following statements most accurately reflects nursing accountability in the intraoperative phase? One, I would like to see the client have a regional anesthetic rather than a general anesthetic. Two, there seems to be a missing sponge, so a recount should be done of all the sponges that have been removed. Three, did the client receive the medication and sign the consent? And four, the client looks to be reactive and stable. And the correct answer is two. There seems to be a missing sponge, so a recount should be done of all the sponges that have been removed. So in the question, they're asking about the intraoperative phase, so during surgery, right? This is very important. Why is too important? Because if you count during surgery, there was only, you count only six sponges, but you know you had seven, you want to make sure that you did not leave that seven sponge inside of the patient. So we're going to recount, right? Let's look at our other choices. One, I'd like to see, have the client, I would like to see the client have a regional anesthetic uh, rather than a general anesthetic. That's pre-op. We haven't done the surgery yet. That's before the surgery. Three, did the client receive medications and sign the consent? That is pre-op, before the surgery. And four, the client looks to be reactive and stable. That is post-op, after the surgery. So the only one that actually um, goes over the nurse's responsibility or accountability during the surgical process is choice number two. The client will have an incision in the lower left abdomen. Which of the following measures by the nurse will decrease discomfort in the incisional area when the client coughs postoperatively? One, applying a sprint direct, applying a splint directly over the ab lower abdomen. Two, keeping the client flat with the feet flexed. Three, turning the client on their right side. Or four, applying pressure above and below the incision. And the correct answer is one, applying a splint directly over the lower abdomen. So guys, when the patient's coughing, when the patient's sneezing, when the patient does anything that will increase pressure, it's going to cause pain, right? So to decrease that pain, you want to decrease that pressure. How do you decrease the pressure? You splint that area. That splint provides support. You splint either with the hand or more preferably with a pillow. 
wherever so for example this patient had um surgery on the left lower abdomen you're going to put that pillow and split them in the left lower abdomen so that when they do something that will cause increased pressure such as deep breathing coughing sneezing anything that increases the pressure that splint supports the area it decreases the pressure which thereby decreases the patient's pain okay and it's always good to have the patient lie on the side where they had the surgery so the patient had the surgery on the left side you want them to lie down on the left side why that does two things number one it splints that area and number two that pressure on lying on that left side that pressure on that left area what do you think that pressure does decrease the chance of bleeding right so choice two three and four are all wrong only choice one is the correct answer you want to decrease pressure which decreases the patient's pain a client in the package recovering from a vagotomy and pyloroplasty which of the following is a normal expectation of the client in this stage of recovery one return return normal bowel sounds on auscultation two pain that's relieved with non-invasive comfort measures three voluntary bladder control and function or four a subdued level of consciousness and neurological function And the correct answer is four, a subdued level of consciousness and neurological function. Why? This patient's still in the PACU. They are recovering from the anesthesia. They are recovering from the dilated or whatever drugs that were given to, given to the patient to help kind of calm them down and ease the amount of um, anesthetics that need to be used anyway. So we expect to see a subdued level of consciousness and neural functioning. Choice one, two, and three are all wrong. They still have anesthesia in their system. We're not expecting to hear normal bowel sounds. We expect to hear either none or very decreased. Choice two, pain relief with non-invasive measures. They just had surgery. Uh, no, they're going to need pain meds IV, all right? And choice three, voluntary control of function. Nope, they still have anesthesia in their system. They are not going to be able to control those sphincters at all. So the only correct answer for this question is choice number four. A client is scheduled for abdominal surgery and has just received the pre-op medications. The nurse should one, keep the quiet, client quiet, two, obtain consent, three, prepare the skin of, at the surgical site, or four, place the side rails up on the bed or stretcher. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is four, place the side rails up on the bed or stretcher. They just got heavy medication for heavy sedation, which places the patient at what? Risk for falls. So not only are you going to put the side rails up, you're going to do what? Make sure that bed is in the lowest position. You remind that patient not to get out of bed. You're going to put that call button next to them and you make sure that patient doesn't get out of bed because they're at high risk for falls. Look at choice number one. Keep the qu client quiet. Why? For what? That's not the answer. There's no need for that. Two, obtain consent. Um, excuse me, consent was supposed to be obtained before those meds. If that consent was not obtained and that patient's medicated, surgery's canceled. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to have to notify the surgeon. You're going to have to notify the nursing supervisor. Surgery is canceled because that patient cannot perform, um, provide informed consent if they were under the influence of mind-altering drugs. Choice three, prepare the skin at the surgical site. That's going to be done in the pre-op unit or in the OR, not done on the floor. So the correct answer is four, okay? The nurse is completing the pre-op checklist for an adult client who's scheduled for an operative procedure later in the morning. Which of the following pre-op assessment findings for this client indicates the need to contact the anesthesiologist? One, a temperature of 100 degrees. Two, the pulse of 90 beats per minute. Three, respiratory rate of 20 breaths per minute, or four, blood pressure is 130 over 74. The correct answer is one, temperature of 100. If a patient's going to have surgery, they cannot have any signs and symptoms of infection at all. 
no coughing, no sneezing, no runny nose, no temperature, no fever, nothing. Okay, so you see that temperature of 100? Yeah, surgery is going to be canceled. Choice two, three, and four are all are within normal limits. There's no reason um, to contact the anesthesiologist. Okay, but if the patient has a fever or any sign and symptom of an infection, especially an upper respiratory infection, you have to notify the doctor. Surgery will be canceled. In the post-operative period, the nurse recognizes that an early sign of malignant hyperthermia is one, fever, two, tachycardia, three, muscle relaxation, or four, skin pallor. And the correct answer is two, tachycardia. So the question is, what they're asking is for is an early sign of malignant hyperthermia. Okay, malignant hyperthermia, that's an adverse reaction to what? Anesthesia. Okay, so what are those signs and symptoms? And the correct answer is two. You're going to see tachycardia. You're going to see tachypnea. You're going to see um, jaw and muscle rigidity. Okay. All of those are signs and symptoms of malignant hyperthermia. You see number one, fever? That's a late sign, not an early sign. So yes, malignant hyperthermia, the temperature goes up, but fever is a late sign. You should have caught it before that patient had a fever, okay? Tachy like I said, tachycardia, tachypnea, the jaw or muscle um, rigidity. Choice uh, number three, muscle relaxation. Uh-uh, they're going to have the opposite. We're going to see muscle what? Rigidity. And then four, skin pallor. No, skin pallor, you see that when the patient's body is cool, not hot. So the correct answer is two. The client tells the nurse that blowing into this tube thing in center spirometer is a ridiculous waste of time. The nurse explains that the specific purpose of the therapy is to one, directly remove excess secretions from the lungs, two, increase pulmonary circulation, three, promote lung expansion, or four, stimulate the cough reflex. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. And the correct answer is three. The point of the incentive spirometer is to promote lung expansion. Why do we want lung expansion? It helps the patient not get what? Atelectasis, right? Pneumonia. So that's why we have them do um, the incentive spirometer. We want to prevent pulmonary complications that can come from surgery. The patient has surgery, they're not moving much, they're in pain, they don't want to turn cough debreathe, which what? Turn cough debreathing helps promote mus um, lung expansion. It helps prevent atelectasis and pneumonia. So you have to explain that to the patient so they can understand why the incentive spirometer is so important. The female client on the surgical unit is being prepared for abdominal surgery with general anesthesia. In preparing this client for surgery, the nurse should one, leave all her jewelry intact, two, provide her with sips of water for a dry mouth, three, remove her makeup and nail polish, or four, remove her hearing aid before transport to the operating room. And the correct answer is three, remove her makeup and nail polish. Why? We want that skin and, and nail exposed so we can look at what? Their circulation, their oxygenation. Are they turning blue? Are they turning ashen gray? Or do they have that nice pink color like we want to see, right? So we want the skin and nail exposed. So that's why number three is the answer. Let's go through our wrong choices. One, leave all her jewelry intact. No, the patient's going to have to take off her jewelry. She can put it in the hospital safe or give it to a trusted family member, right? Choice two, provide her with sips of ma um, water for dry mouth. No, patient's about to go into surgery. They're going to be NPO. Choice four, remove her hearing aid before transport to the operating room. Assistive devices such as the hearing aid, the patient can keep it in until they get to the pre-op unit, then it can be removed then right? But they, they'll want to hear on their way going to the surgery center, they may want to hear what's going on and that's fine. They can leave that in and the hearing aid can come out uh, when they get to the pre-op unit. 
And we're already down to our last question, guys. The client asked the nurse about the purpose of having medications such as Demerol or Visterol given before surgery. The nurse should inform the client that these particular medications, one, reduce pre-op fear, two, promote emptying of the stomach, three, reduce body secretions, or four, ease the induction of the anesthesia. And I accidentally gave you the answer to this question when I was talking about something else, so I hope you remember what I said. I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is four. I talked about this already, that these medications help to um, ease the induction of anesthesia. It helps so that the patient will not need as much anesthesia, okay? What else does it do? It also prevents um, nausea and vomiting so the patient doesn't aspirate, okay? And it can also help relieve the anxiety and fear of the surgery, but it's not given specifically to relieve the anxiety of, of fear, um, anxiety and fear that comes with surgery. That's just a wonderful side effect that comes with the anesthesia and, excuse me, that comes with these meds before the anesthesia is given. But the reason we give these pre-op meds is to help ease the induction of anesthesia. So guys, I hope that you found this video helpful. I hope that you appreciate the content that I'm bringing to you. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe below. Press that um, red button. And guys, please share my videos, please. Um, anyone that you know that you think would benefit a, a coworker, um, someone in your study group, go ahead and share my video. I'm trying to get to my first thousand likes. I appreciate you spending this time with me. I actually was hoping to get through more questions. So guys, I'm going to make a part two because these are really, really, really good, important concepts that you absolutely must know before you move on to med surge. So I don't want to um, shortchange you. So watch out for part two coming. Thank you for spending this time with me and I'll see you on the next video.